pray. I don't know about you, but I don't know if you realize that there is a certain power that comes with the number three. If we were in the world, we would say, third time, lucky. You know, and the theme of three runs around the lots of society. You look at God, and we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy. You can look at other things in the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac, and it's the power of three. We can bring it even further than that. We can say body, mind, and spirit. We can get really um, the New Testament and go faith, hope, and absolutely. We could go a little bit off course and we could talk about the, um, the three blind mice. We could even talk about the, the three bears. We could even talk about I mean, actually, three little pigs. But maybe we could get onto my favourite, which is of course McDonald's, McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken and a pizza. Now, that was obviously just me. You can tell I'm hungry already this morning. Power three. But Roman, Romans 12, 12, Paul gives us three things to challenge us. Three things that we want to think about this morning. It says this, be joyful in hope. Be patient. Affliction and be faithful in prayer. And I wonder if Paul, as he was writing to the Roman church, thought they had they had these three things nailed down. Maybe they would turn back to Paul and say, Hey, Paul, hope, you know, we got that down to a T, don't worry about us, we know where our hope is, that's okay. Hey, Paul, no need to worry about affliction, we've got that sorted, we've got it done with. No problem, we can handle affliction in our lives, don't worry. We get them before they get us. Or maybe we can talk about prayer. Prayer being something that, oh God, don't worry about prayer, Lord, we do it, no problem. We've got that nailed down. We are perfectionists, we've got it, no problem. Paul, don't need to worry about us in these three areas of our Christian faith. But Paul reminds them in these three areas to take up a different posture. To take up a different posture when it comes to our hope. To take up a different posture when it comes to affliction. A different posture when it comes to our brave life. You see, the whole book of Romans talks about it, what we believe. You know, Paul writing earlier in Romans, he gets really heavy on some theological stuff. Talking about the righteousness of Christ. Talk about the righteousness that we have in Christ. But Paul was concerned that the theology that they had, the revelation that they had, wouldn't just be for their learning, but would be for their living. I don't know if you know some people. You might be one of them, so I've got to be careful. And I can, I can include myself in this bracket as well. But you know, you do GCSEs. Then what else comes next after Jesus? Go to college. Got some more exams. Then, then after that, well, maybe you've got exams in your work. Uh, and then maybe you've got some more exams that you've got to take up. Get CPD, Career Professional Development. Ooh, I can see all of you have to do those things going on. Rather not. But you think, well, when do the exams stop? When does the training stop? And Paul was concerned. Not that they just had loads of training in what was right in God's word. Not that they believed what was right. But they lived it as well. Because we can have all the thoughts in the world about God. We can have all the thoughts in the world about the Trinity. We can have all the thoughts in the world from the Bible about creation and about those sorts of things. But unless we live it out, folks, I just think it's a waste. Unless we're going to live it out when we go to our workplaces, it's a waste. Unless we live it out when we're going to go with our families and put these things into practice, it's a waste. Unless we're going to live it out in our church experience, it's going to be a waste. Our, our learning is for our living, and we've got to get it right. And Paul was saying, take up a different posture. When it comes to your hope, take up a different posture. Be joyful in your hope. Have you ever come across some people, and they might be a little bit, ah, yeah, they, they may be a Christian, maybe they believe, maybe they're, but they've got no joy in their life. It's so way deep down. I think, well, where's the joy that you're meant to have with this hope? Or maybe, maybe they go into affliction, they go into something, and you think, well, I'm not sure that that's what taught how Paul and how the Bible taught, teaches us to deal with affliction. I, I was in a court, um, uh, uh, training 
few days away. Talk about training, it will all be an ongoing. It was a week before last at the Ealing MIT conference. And uh, one of the speakers there, a guy called Liam Evans, he's absolutely brilliant from Life Central Church in Hales Owen. And he said, as a leader, I know that people are after me. I, I know that people want to come against me. I know that people challenge the way I do church. I know that people confront me on certain things. And he says, my, my temptation is this, is that I want to guard my back. Because I know people are out to get me, and I want to get them before, I want to get in there, you know. I want to be there with the responses when they're going to come and criticize me. And he says he's learned after years and years of ministry, folks, it's not about guarding his back, it's about guarding his heart. How true of that is, is that of life, folks? When, when things come against us, when, when we want to look after ourselves, when we think, oh man, I'd rather go for that person, how dare they say that about me? I'd like to stamp that thing out, push it on its head and beat it down to a pole. Folks, it's not about guarding our back as leaders. It's not about guarding your back in work, can I say. It's not about guarding your back in your family. It's about guarding your heart. Because out of the wealth of our heart springs wealth, the wealth springs of life, flow up. If our heart turns hard, if our heart turns bitter, if our heart turns, 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 you know, just disappointed and and angry and full of angst, then we're in real trouble, folks. People can come against us. People can do things. People can say things about you. People can say things about me. Sometimes we just gotta let it go and guard our heart and let God fight our battles for us. I don't know why I started talking about that, because it's got nothing to do with what I want to say this morning. But let's keep going. Your posture this morning, your posture as we go through hope, uh, affliction, and prayer. Two receptionists work for the same company. First receptionist, the phone goes, she picks up the phone, and she, she, it takes about ten rings for her to answer the phone. The person on the other end of the line is a client of the company, and says, I'd like to speak to, you, to the managing director, please. Can I be put through to him? Uh, and she sort of <coughs> clears the, the coffee from her mouth and the, <coughs> the biscuits and, uh, and she sort of looks at her phone, uh, which number she's made, got to find out where the director is sitting at that day uh, on her phone. Uh, and she, she talks to a colleague on the other side of the desk and says, is the director in today? We don't even know. Uh, and she says to the person, the client on the other end of the line, she says, uh, one minute I'll be back with you. She talks about a few other things in the office that's going on. She said, takes back the line to the client and says, yeah, I think he's in today, but let me just check. Dials his number. Bring, 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 bring. Client's on hold. Bring, 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 not. Oh, he's just gone to the toilet. One second. I'm sure he won't be long. Don't worry about it. Bring, 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 still on hold. Bring, bring, bring. He'll be with you now. Don't worry about it. By which time, the client on the other end of the phone wanted to speak to the director. It's at his wit's end. He said, I'll just speak to anyone, it doesn't matter. And the receptionist puts him through to the managing director. Next day, the same client rings back. He gets put through to a different receptionist. Receptionist answers the phone within two two beeps of the phone ringing. She says, good morning, sir, how can I help you? The client says, oh, hi there, thank thank you. My my, my name is is Mr. Davis. Uh, Can I speak to the managing director? I said... She said, no, the receptionist said to the client, no problem, sir, let me see if he's, he's available for you. Puts him on hold, the client then waits just a few moments and is put through to the managing director. You see, the client on two different occasions was both was put through to the managing director who he wanted to speak to. But the way he got there was far different. The first receptionist had a posture that this client didn't matter. The f- second receptionist was on guard, was standing post, was doing her job diligently and well. She took up an entirely different posture to the first receptionist. And as Christians, folks, we're called to take up a different posture as we go through life. We're called to take up postures of joy, postures of patience, and postures of faithfulness in every season of life. I came across this quote and I thought it was so, so good. Talking about Romans 12, verse 12. We know that this joy is in Jesus. And this hope is for Jesus. And this patience is from Jesus. And this tribulation is with Jesus. 
and his constant prayer is through Jesus to God, our Father. I thought that was a good thing to share with you this morning. Let me look at it today. There's a quote, it's up there. Let me go on to this next point. What kind of hope do you have? Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 says this. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. In a world where everything is shaking at the moment, folks, for whatever reason, we need a firm anchor that won't be shaken in times of difficulty. When the health system and our health sometimes is in chaos, we need an anchor that is firm and secure for our lives. When our families go through seasons of upheaval and uncertainty, we need an anchor that is firm and secure for our life. When the economy and our job situation goes up one minute and down the next, boom and bust, we need an anchor that is firm and secure for our life. When our relationships go through high seasons of great joy and low seasons of despair, we need an anchor that is firm and secure, and our anchor is Jesus. Do you see, the hope that God gives is a hope that promises to us that whatever life comes, his word to us stays true. I like things that are firm and secure. And next week when we go camping, as, as the night draws in, as, as the, the skies turn back, black in the evening, I will be going around our tents and looking at the pegs and the guy ropes and wondering to myself, is this thing infirm enough? I will be thinking, do I need to put a few more pegs in the ground to hold us down? I'll be checking the weather to see what is coming next. Will my six round ten be able to stand what is coming? And my family look very nervous as we do this camping business together. But I will be checking to see if it holds if it's gonna hold firm and hold secure. Job in the Bible was a man who went through incredible shaking. Shaking of his faith. In Job 13, verse 15, Job, however, says these words. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Job didn't hope in his circumstances changing, which if I'm honest, is what I hope in sometimes. Job didn't hope that somehow thing, thing, things would, 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 would turn around. God, Job said, my hope is in my God. My hope is in my Lord. And even though it doesn't make sense what I'm going through now, my hope is in him. You see, it's one thing to say that you hope in God before you go through a storm. You know, maybe life is going all right for you right now. And you can say that your hope is in God. Brilliant. How good is that? Maybe you've come through some trials and some fiery seasons of life. And you can look back on that and say, God was with me. You can do it post the event. You know, after everything has gone on, you can say, God, you've been with me. And my, my, my hope is in you. But it's a whole other thing to put your hope in God and say your hope is in God in the middle of the trial. That's what Job does. And that's what God calls us to do. I can think of some other things that I, I would like to put before be joyful in hope. You know, Paul says be joyful in hope. I, I think a lot of Christians today, about their hope, they say, I'm worried in my hope. How about this? I, I'm selfish in my hope because I like it to keep it, I want to keep it to myself. I'm reluctant to share it with others, so I just want to keep it to me. I don't want to have to, have to tell anyone else. How about this one? I, I'm nervous. With my hope. I'm not so sure about my hope. How about this one? I'm full of doubts in hope. What about this? I'm reserved in hope. There's a woman who's been in the press a lot over the last few months, weeks, even years. And you know, there's a woman by the name Deborah James. You might recognize her. She, she battled cancer for a long time. And she said this in these last days of her life here on earth. She says, have a rebellious hope. But I believe 
If Paul was here this morning talking to you, he would say, have a joyful hope. Have a joyful hope. Not just uh, having a joyful hope. I want to talk this morning about having a patience in affliction. Being patient in trials. Let me ask you a question. What is your pain threshold like? Now all the women here who have been through childbirth, obviously you've got to start on us men because you've obviously got a far higher pain threshold than us. Isn't that right, ladies? Yes. Come on. Come on. Okay. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. But certain studies have taken place about different cultures and different people across the world. And they look at what people have higher pain thresholds than others. And it's been found that older people have a higher threshold than younger people. Now all of you over age 50 here are going, yeah, we know we're a lot harder than this snowflake generation that's coming after us, a bunch of softies. We know we're a lot harder than that. But then the study looks at different athletes, and they looked at Olympic athletes, and they realized that they could cope with severe pain because of the training that they put themselves through. Each and every day, you know, to work up to that Olympic medal. Each and every day, you know, to deny themselves that extra piece of cake. Each and every day, you know, to watch what they were eating and to push their bodies to their extremes. But then they looked also at the Nepalese Sherpas. They looked at the Nepalese Sherpas because this group of people, they live in the Himalayan mountain range. And when Western people come to the foot of Everest and want to scale the heights of Everest, Western people find it really, really difficult. Whereas these Sherpas, these Nepalese people, can do it no problem. They, in fact, often carry the suitcases and the equipment for the Westerners up the Mount Everest so that they can get to the top. And they'll do it a few times in a week, while us Westerners will maybe just about manage to scramble to the top with oxygen on our backs and carry nothing. But they looked at these Sherpas and they thought, well, what is it that makes them unique? What is it? Why can they do it? Is there something in their bloodstream? Is there something in their bones? Is there something in their DNA? And do you know what they found? They looked at them after huge studies and they realized that there was nothing different from the Sherpas to the Westerners. Nothing at all. The only thing that they could find that was different was that these Sherpas grew up in that environment and were used to putting themselves through the harsh, painful altitude training every day of their lives because that's where they lived. They could do it no problem. Whereas the Westerners who come along can only barely just about make it up to the top if everything's going their way. And I want to say as Christians, when affliction comes along, when trials come along, we've got to get more used to it, folks. We've got to grow a backbone. We've got to get harder skins because Jesus promised us that trouble would come. And we've got to ad adapt a posture that is patient in affliction. Rather than wanting to run away from it when difficult seasons come, we've got to be patient. Rather than looking to escape and take ourselves out of that environment, we've got to be patient and allow God to do his work. Rather than being soft and rather than wanting to escape, we've got to do as Paul says and adopt this position of patience. Earlier in the book of Romans, and this is going to mess with some of our theologies, folks, but this is what he says. Glory in your sufferings. Glory in your sufferings. I don't know about you, but when hard times come, I'm thinking, God, get me out of this. I'm thinking, God, deliver me. God, take it away. God, extract me from this so I don't have to do it. But actually, we've got to go through it. Because in the same verse, that's Romans 5, verse 3. Just, just after it, it says, your suffering produces perseverance. Your perseverance produces character. And character still counts. And your character produces hope. 
And I think a number of reasons why people don't have character these days is because they bailed out in the suffering stage. They bailed out when it got tough, didn't hold the line, didn't stay in the course with God and in the fire of church. They, 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 they left when they could. And they, they didn't develop character in there as individuals. I can put different things in front of um, being patient in, in suffering, being patient in affliction. Rather than being patient, I, I like to blame someone else. And anyone else here, you know, maybe going through a difficult season? Well, it was the children's fault. They made me, they made me grumpy. That's why I lose my, that's why I lose my rag in the car or with someone at work. If only my children would behave themselves, I'd be a little bit more patient. Or, or maybe, maybe rather than just blaming someone else, you, you like to post about it online. You know, you like to put it on your Instagram account, your Facebook account, uh, all the trial and all the suffering that you're going in. Maybe you like to cry in reflection rather than be patient. Maybe you like to blame someone else. How about this? Maybe you like to find a solution when you go through affliction. Anyone else try and figure it out and think, come on, right? I can do a look at this in a mathematical way, a logical way. If I do this, do this, I'll be free of this by Easter. If I do this, I do this, do this, yeah, that's going to be a way out of it. Paul was encouraging us to be patient, be patient in affliction. Psalm 23 says this, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Come, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I don't know about you, but walking, I don't know if any walkers in the house, anyone like to walk? Few of you? <coughs> Walking, I believe, requires a lot of discipline. Because when I walk, I'm tempted just to run. Anyone that? You think, well, if I run, I'll get a little bit quicker. Anyone there? You know, when you walk, oh, maybe I should just sit down and have another break. Stop off at the cafe again. You know, have another bag of bacon, frazzles, keep me going. But walking, folks, yeah, you know, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Requires discipline. Requires discipline and patience. Let me tell you, Joseph's affliction took him to the palace. Jesus' affliction took him to the cross. Paul's thorn in the flesh led him to pen some of the most incredible words in the New Testament. Like the light in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am strong, then, when I am weak, just checking, <laughs> then I am strong. Turn to someone to say, how's your pain threshold? Go on, turn to someone, just check that you're still with me. I'm nearly done. How's your pain threshold? But finally, let me look at this. Be faithful in prayer. Do you know that most people pray? Even people who, who, who wouldn't consider themselves Christian believers, most people pray. Over 55% of people, get this, say that they pray every day. That's incredible. 21% say that they pray weekly or monthly. 23% say that they seldom pray or never pray. And even those religiously unaffiliated with any group, even 20% in that bracket of people say that they pray daily. Matthew 6, verse 6 says this, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let me tell you this, private prayer, folks, equals public power. Private prayer gives us public power. I don't know if anyone else is here, but when I set time uh, aside to pray, I always seem to find something else to do. The phone goes, I have to check this email, something comes along and something needs doing. Anyone else have that battle in their prayer life? There's always something that comes up. I like to pray first thing in the morning, but let me tell you, you don't have to do that. Find some time of the day you can just set it aside with God and pray. Be faithful in your prayer. There's something about God that loves faithfulness. He loves faithfulness in your life. Faithfulness to just praying and talking 
to him. I, I put a few different things in front of that being faithful in prayer. Rather than being faithful in prayer, I, I realise that sometimes I'm sporadic in prayer. Sometimes I'm inconsistent in, in prayer. Sometimes I'm desperate in prayer. But Paul says, be faithful in your prayer. Let me give you just four things in prayer. When you pray, don't forget to praise God. Give thanks to him for something that he's done in your life, however small it might be. When you come to pray, ah, repent. Say sorry for things that you've done. Say sorry, admit, confess things that you've done wrong to God. A, be free to ask God of things. Ask him. Another A, ask him for the things that you need, but pray aloud. You know, find somewhere quiet when people want things that you're nutty. It might be in your car on the way to work, it might be on a walk, somewhere quiet, but don't be afraid to pray aloud to God. He loves hearing your voice. Why? Yield. Yield to God in your prayer. Say, God, I submit to you. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in, in heaven. Praise, repent, ask, yield. There's an incredible song that was written a, few, a couple of years ago by Elevation Worship, just about talking to Jesus, and the chorus of it says this. There's no wrong way to do it. There's no bad time to start. It doesn't have to sound pretty. Just tell him what's on your heart. Because it's not about a religion. It's more about a friendship. Just talk to him like he's your father, like you are his kid. Just start talking to Jesus. Let's stand, folks. And just start talking to Jesus as we close up here this morning. You know what? The, the three B's, we talk about it being power in three. B, let me go back to my notes. Be joyful in hope. Don't be. Don't be depressed, you know. Be joyful in it, folks. Make a difference. Be patient in your affliction. And be faithful in the praise that you've got. I'm just going to read that line, that, those lines that I read out at the start. We know that this joy is in Jesus. And this hope is for Jesus. And this patience is from Jesus. This tribulation is with Jesus. And this constant prayer is through Jesus to our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, in this time now, where maybe we've just got a couple of minutes, where we don't want to rush away, but we'd like to spend it talking to you. We'd like to talk, we'd like to spend it telling you what's on our heart, telling you what's going on in our lives, Maybe giving you thanks, maybe yielding to you, maybe asking you for, to do something in our life that needs to be done. Maybe just saying sorry, repenting in these moments. I'm going to give you one minute, folks. I'm going to be quiet. You can just start praying to your Heavenly Father. Go.